Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. As uh, Hadrian said in the advertisement for this evening, tonight we're going to talk about life, love, and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. How many of you have seen it? Raise your hands, would you? Not that many. Are you guys timid? Raise your hands if you've seen it. Shit, I thought everybody's, oh, you're, you're in for something. Oh, man. Uh, well, in 1974, uh, I, at that time I thought the two greatest horror films ever made were Psycho and Diabolique. And both of those films still live, and they're still great. But then someone told me about a little film that was made for not a lot of money uh, in Austin, Texas, and it was the scariest film of all time. And I thought, bullshit, you know? <laughs> Everybody's got this biggest this, the scariest that. No one has the smallest or the least or the <laughs> lightest. It's all, everything's inflated. And then I saw the film, and it is the most terrifying film I've ever seen. It is, to me, it's, it's a great film. There are other great films. None of them are tender-hearted love stories. But this is... <laughs> Thanks, Dad. This is a great movie, and it will scare the piss out of you. Uh, and so... Um, I wanted to just tell you that when I saw the film, I called, I got a hold of the phone number of the young man who had made the film. I called him, I told him what I thought about the film, and I said, if you ever get out to Hollywood, I'd love to meet you, and if I can introduce you to anybody, I'll be happy to do that, because you are a great filmmaker. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to try and get really to the heart of what inspired and provoked this film. So let me now introduce you to the man who co-produced, co-wrote, and directed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, ladies and gentlemen, Toby Hooper. Come on up, Toby. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks for showing up. This has been a long trip getting, um, well, you know, getting, getting to 40 years uh, here, but, uh, but also I've been on the road a long time uh, uh, with, with the, the, the new restoration. And, um, and it, took, you know, it took a, lot of, a hell of a lot of time. And, um, and, and I, I didn't want to lose the intent of the original film with, with the, the grittiness. Uh, but it's, but, you know, but, but the seven to one sound, <coughs> excuse me, is really slick. And, uh, uh, and uh, thanks for coming, I'm, I'm way touched. Thank you guys. You shot this film originally in 16 millimeter. That's, yeah, that's right. Uh, let me ask you something. If somebody told you that down the street there was a house full of crazies sitting around picking up young kids or whoever off the street and they were chopping them up and wearing their faces <laughs> and uh, uh, cooking them for dinner, would you go down and try and catch that uh, on your way home? <laughs> For real? For real. No. What is it, do you suppose, that causes us to want to see this film all these years, 40 years, of some of, obviously, the most disturbing acts known to man? What is it that makes, I mean, here's a full house of people tonight. I'll try not to turn my back to you. I'd like to stand, but he doesn't want to. 
Maybe. I've, I've oh, been on so the road. He's since, been on the road. So a long time. Laying on the road or? On the road, almost at times. So, what do you, what what do you suppose it is that makes, and this is I would say a young audience, come back again and again to experience this vicariously. I was at a, at a time in my filmmaking life that that I was really into European films, and because they they were far superior, in my opinion, uh, to, you know, like uh, uh, pillow talk and the things that, that were out there. And, and even in the genre, like Godzilla, and, and there's nothing wrong with Godzilla and that mythology at all. Um, but but I, I think what it is, is I had an attitude, why in the hell can't you make a good movie with, with, with characters that are compelling uh, and that you can sense they have something going on before the characters, before the movie ever starts. Uh, you know, therefore, when they're introduced on the screen, they're alive. Uh, and and you, you're either identifying with them or not that it doesn't matter so long as you sense that they are real. And, and, and the film has a progression and so, so, so many people have seen it, I, I don't want to do spoilers, but it loops back around into itself. And it's, and it's, and it's about no escape. But, it, but it's, also, it's, a, it's also about uh, just how damn strong women are. I mean, women kick ass in this movie. I mean, I mean there's a very strong woman that's, that's being driven on uh, adrenaline hysteria. And just, uh, you know, she's just not going to die. Uh, and uh, well, we and don't know if she does yet. We don't. Does not No. But oh no. He, here's the thing. <laughs> no, by God, we. Jeez, whiz, no. Well, here's the thing. I think, just speaking personally, that there are only a few reasons that make people want to go and see a movie and sometimes see it again and again. And that's either to laugh or to cry or to be scared. And I think now you have to add a fourth, which is to be transported to a world that you have never experienced before. I think those are the only four reasons I can find. I don't know anyone that goes to see a movie and to say, oh, that was really interesting. You know, if you come out and you say, that was interesting, it was a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, who, who cares about interesting, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you want an emotional response. And uh, I think that your film, this one, I'm not gonna talk about any of your other films tonight. This is about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but I think your film fulfills all of that. What a lot of people are about to find out is how you've laced the humor into it too. It does, in spite of delivering on its title, it will make you laugh from time to time. Well, it, 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 and it, it will, and, 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 and it comes from an ironic place, uh, uh, the laughter, because it's, uh, it shouldn't be funny. I mean, to, to quote a line that, uh, that a lot of people know is, look what your brother's done to the door. Uh, you know, well, you know but, that one. But, 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 but that's his reality. And I, th and I think you sense that as a reality. Uh, I mean, that's about family values. And, 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 and I mean, it is. And, 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 uh, and, it's, and it's dysfunction on a level that you can kind of buy at the same time because those people, those characters. I didn't want, when the movie started, you, you, you know how, how in a, a, a lot of genre, a lot of films, that when the movie starts, it's the first day of the life of the character. You, you know, and it doesn't, it, you don't have a sense that there, there was anything before the movie started. Right. And, 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 and so, and so, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, fall into 
uh, something already in progress. Uh, and, and it's, you know, it's a bad day for everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a bad day for Leatherface, believe me. <laughs> let, 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 let. But the audience can sit there in the dark, what we both refer to as the safe darkness. Yes. The safe darkness. And that's what I think does it. You can sit out here and you can watch this happening to people who you can relate to, but you are safe. This is not happening to you. It's happening in front of you, but not to you. But you do take it home with you, unfortunately. I wanted to tell you something. Today, I got an email from a young film director named Nicholas Winding Refn. Yeah. You guys know him? Yeah. He sent me an email, and he said that he introduced this film and you in Cannes this last May. Yeah, too. It had a screening at the Cannes Film Festival, which is one of the great uh, film festivals in the world. And he said that he asked the entire audience to stand up and wish this man a palm d'or, which is the grand prize. And the whole audience stood up and gave him a huge rousing ovation, supporting the idea that if anyone ever deserved a grand prize for a film, it was this man. He asked me if I would ask you if you want to do the same thing, would you? Let's stand up and just give this man the skin he deserves. All right. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Thank you. So I have to ask you now, the film has been honored at Cannes this year. Yeah, and it's 40th year. And 40 years ago. And, and 40 and years ago Zane. it ran at the Cannes Film Festival, yeah. and not everything can get in there. And there's a print in the Museum of Modern Art. So when somebody tells you this film is a work of art, how do you feel about that? Do you, you, did you ever think about making a work of art? Or were you simply trying to make a commercial film, a horror film, that people would see? Oh, Bill, that's, uh, um, <laughs> you, you know, I mean, I, I, You think I, this is a work of art? <laughs> You know, I've heard that you should never say that you're an artist, but let people say it. And and I uh, and and uh, should I be modest? No, yeah. definitely not. You never it's, have it's been. A so work of why art? start now? Yeah, no, that's a fucking work of art, man. What? No, it's a fucking work of art. Okay. <laughs> now you know. Now you know. You didn't just waste a night to come and see another fucking horror film. You're in the presence of a work of art. And I will say that there is a, there is a style in painting that it's, it's hard to characterize. I don't know how you would characterize the work of this man. Are you familiar with the paintings of Francis Bacon? Yes. Th this film reminds me a lot of the paintings of Bacon in that they, they are really uh, his impression of people, but they are the truth about the inner person. And I, I think, strangely, this film gets to that. What was the inspiration for in, this film? In that respect, uh, uh, Weiss. What? Uh, Weiss, Christina's World. Oh, Andrew Weiss? Andrew Weiss. Was one of the inspirations? Yeah, yeah. You familiar with that painting? Andrew Weiss, Christina's World. Eight people go to a museum here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I've done one based uh, 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 emotionally and visually on uh, uh, Hopper uh, as well. Yeah, I, I do choose those. As uh, inspiration? Those, as in, not all the time, but... but it's I, in the I, back of your mind. Yeah. So tell us now about Ed Gein. 
Okay, okay, Ed, okay, this, when I was like, uh, when I was four years old, something like that, four, maybe five, I, I know I could comprehend things at, at three, so it, 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 it could have been that. Um, and I was uh, living in Austin, Texas, uh, and uh, in a hotel. I, my, my, my dad was in the hotel business, and I grew up in hotels. I didn't live in a house until I was a, a grown man. And um, uh, uh, relatives, I had relatives from Wisconsin that lived down the street. I mean, I mean, no, not just down the street, but down the highway, uh, like 18 or 20 miles from uh, this incident that uh, of Ed Gain. And I, I didn't know his name. I didn't, I didn't know the details. I just heard about human skin lampshades and, and human skin furniture. But, but, but it burned a, you know, burned a hole in my head. And, 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 and terrified me because at the same time I was finding out, you know, my, one, one of my relatives said, you know, the world will come to an end one day. And that, 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 that was so fucking disturbing. <laughs> and and uh, I was a happy little tyke. And, um, and, and so, so that became, that became an influence, uh, just the idea of that. And, and I, I, you know, I didn't know that it was kind of close. Uh, when, when I was a teenager, I didn't, I didn't know that Psycho was uh, uh, basically a, a, about Ed Gein. Uh, and, um, and, and I read about it, like four or five years after the movie came out, that it was based on um, Ed Gein, well, it, it, it was in this kind of cosmic spirit way. Um, now, there's an actor in the film named Ed Gwynn, and, and, um, and Ed Gein, uh, this was in the, in the 90s, I think. May have been late 80s, it was late 80s. He was up for getting out of, of uh, this mental institution. Uh, I read about it, heard about it. And, and, and I was doing something at Fox, uh, uh, working on a screenplay. And they, someone called me in the office and said that Ed Gwynn is, uh, wants to come in and meet you. Well, I got out, you know, I left the office. I got the, the two names confused. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, you know, I, you gotta be, somebody's either kidding me or some kind of shit's going on. And have, you ever, have you ever heard of Ed Gein? Yeah. For those of you who haven't, it was in the sort of mid-50s. A guy living in Wisconsin, a rural neighborhood, nicest guy in the world. Everyone thought he was a good neighbor, a little quiet, you know, uh, not outgoing at all. He had a little house. And it, the people in the neighborhood thought he was a decent enough guy, just kept to himself. And it turns out that his mother passed away, but he kept her in the bedroom, in her bedroom, while she was dead for years. And he picked up a bunch of people, one way or the other. I'm not sure how. Like grave robbing. He, so he, some of it grave robbing. A lot of it was grave robbing, a, a lot of, of it was cup murders. Yeah. He picked these people up and took them to his house and he would club them or cut, cut them up and he would cut them up and eat their body parts. He would put their body parts all over the house. They were in the refrigerator. Yeah, they were in the stove. The when people came, it was uh, unspeakable. What a human being had done to other human beings. And so Toby has always said to me, and I guess to others in interviews, that he was sort of inspired by that story, or at least he knew that this wasn't a complete fantasy. This guy uh, was doing this stuff and got away with it for many years. And I think one of the reasons that people keep coming back to this film, 
and realize how great and strong an experience it is, is because this stuff is happening more and more. These people are out there. They are out there. I don't know what's, what goes on with the human race, but this was a film that drew back the curtain on the real dark side of human nature, and it stands strong with that to this day. How did you uh, come to make the film? Uh, did someone come to you with a script? Did, I know you made one film before this. You were a, a film student All right. at uh, University of Texas. And uh, was that your sister out there? No, I don't think so. I don't remember. I said it was someone. But you were, a film <laughs> you were a film student, and you had made a film. And then you and a young guy named Kim Henkel, who was your partner, got together to make this. Why this? Well, I had this idea. And, and, and Kim had never written a script yet, but he wanted to, he wanted to be a writer. He was a friend of yours? He, he worked, uh, he was in the, uh, well, I shouldn't say it because he took a pseudonym, this Boris Snur. Uh, uh, he was he was in Eggshells, the the, the film yeah, the I first made. First film. The, and, and 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 so uh, the, the, this thing was a kind of a holiday gift, and uh, you, you know I'll say that, and I, I know a lot of you have heard this story or, or read it, or uh, but but you know it's it's about me in the shopping mall, right? How many people have heard that? How many people heard the story Toby's told about being in a shopping mall? <laughs> at, at, at holiday shopping season, and they're, and they're crowding in. I mean, they just keep coming. And, um, and I, I hate, uh, I just hate uh, shopping. I mean, I, I loathe it. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and so I had, to, I had to get the fuck out. And, and, but, but this wall of people, I mean, I guess it just hit it at, at in, in some ways, the wrong time, but in other ways, the perfect time. Because I, I saw all these people, I knew it was going to take 20, 30 minutes to, uh, y you know, to get my way through a moving crowd. Uh, you know, moving from counter to counter and uh, doing what they do. And I was looking at them, and then I panned down and realized I was standing in the sport in the in the uh, hardware part of the store, and, and in front of me was a, a chainsaw for sale, and um, and it just you know it, it clicked you know if I start this saw, <laughs> I could walk and those people would part, <laughs> and I could get and, and so it it started with that and then I, and then I went to the car, finally got to the car. And and um, and on the way back, driving back back to my house, I th this idea, like a gift, started coming to me because I, I'd always wanted to do something about isolation in, in the woods. That uh, and we were going through a gas shortage where you had to, uh, cars had to queue up for like two miles to get in and get gas rationing. And and, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'd like to do something about that and causing people to be stranded in the woods, you know. The, um, and, and to me, the woods is quite scary. They're not quite so scary anymore, but uh, well, well, yeah, they are actually. <laughs> um, so so anyway, this the the configuration of the story came to me uh, almost like a in a time capsule that, that would open up in the next 30 seconds or minute. And, and, um, and when I got home, I, I, I put on Elton John's Yellow Brick Road and, and sat, sat down on my, uh, my desk chair. The, my, my desk was the floor and the chair had no legs on it. So, and, and, and so I started listening uh, to that. And then I put uh, Lou Reed's Berlin on. And by, by, by the end of that, the, the whole story called, uh, it came to me, the story, the configuration of uh, how it would unfold. And, and then I called Kim on the phone, 
and, and told him the story, and I said, would you be interested in working with me on this? And, the, and then he came straight over with uh, the typewriter. I, I'm no good with the typewriter. And so I would, I would sit in the room and uh, maybe scribble notes. And, and so he, would, uh, he was in the kitchen doing a little typing and we would exchange uh, things. And anyway, that's, and, and then somehow, some way it got on a fast track. Uh, and it was, there was no problem getting the money. Uh, the original budget was uh, $60,000. Uh, and and um, I don't know, but it just, it, it just went, it just was like clean sailing up until the end where um, a, a lot of mistakes made. Now, the great uh, sound mixer, Buzz Knudsen of uh, Tadeo, and who, who Bill knows, um, I, I, I had to mix the picture twice because in 16 millimeter, there, there's this thing called AB rolling to, to get invisible splices. And so I came, I, you know, I came out here and, it came, and Buzz mixed the film once. And then I got back to Austin and the, the, the students that were doing the AB rolling did it ass about backward. And now th th there's something, uh, it's always scrape picture, never black leader, or something like that. I've forgotten what the hell it, or never, never scrape picture, only black. But anyway, <laughs> they did it ass backward. And so I, uh, three quarters of the film. So I, so I had to personally had to go in and recut, um, t take a frame out. Um, uh, you, throughout, I don't know, more than half the film. It meant that I had to remix the, the film when I got finished. And then I, then I came back and then, and then Buzz uh, mixed it again. But, but it also gave me the opportunity to, uh, to sweeten the, uh, the sound. It's like I needed a sound to draw the Pam character's attention uh, to, to the room with the uh, uh, that the, the, the bird is in the, 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 the chicken is in a bird cage. And, and, I, and I needed a rattling sound. And, and they had there at Tadeo, they had, uh, they had the Foley for Reagan screeching around on the bed spring, Bill. And, 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 I, and, I, and I stole a, 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 little, a little bit of it. I know you did. <laughs> but how close? was the script to the film? Was this a tightly scripted film, or were you, was it more of an outline and you made stuff up as you went along? I, I made a lot up as, as I went along, but, but, it, but it was scripted, I mean, it was scripted, and then I would hear it, and, and, and if I couldn't hear the truth in it, you know, if I couldn't hear the truth, and, and uh, uh, you know, I would, I would ch change it on the spot. What about the incidents? Were all of the incidents in the film laid out in a screenplay? Or did a lot of that come to you as kind of found art when a, you were working? A lot, yeah, a lo a lot of that came, came to me that, that wasn't in the screen, screenplay. Uh, uh, and how did, you, how did you cast the film, Toby? I, Who, you know, did people audition? Did you go to people you knew? Yeah, I, I well, I had, I had it uh, at, at UT in the drama department. I, 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 ch I checked out that, and then there's a St. Edwards University that had a drama department. <laughs> um, but um, the, the cook, or Jim Cito, that uh, runs the gas station and is, uh, was a, a Shakespearean actor at uh, the uh, Alley Theater in, in Houston. Oh, yeah. And, and, and um, and then um, uh, Marilyn Burns could, you know, I, I could get her to r run up the, uh, I mean, the 17 times, I mean, we, we, we couldn't afford knee pads <laughs> or didn't know about them. And, 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 she, and she comes in and she does a lot, a lot of physical stuff and, and gets injured a, you, a lot of times. 
you had never made a film like this. You made one film before it, which was right. not this. So what, what gave you the feeling that you could make a, a film um, this powerful, uh, you know, that, that would hold up against something like Psycho and Diabolique and the great horror films that had preceded this? I mean, uh, well, you, you really have to believe in yourself to an extraordinary degree to, to, um, to undertake this as your second film. Yeah, well, well I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I knew I could do it, and I know you knew you could do it. Uh, I didn't know I could do it. Well, I, I did. Shit, I no. did. You know what? I, I, uh, and, and, and I'll get back to, to the, the question, I, I hope. Um, Today? Uh, everyone hated, <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. That, <laughs> everyone hated my guts. I mean, they hated me. By Who's the time, everyone? Everyone on the crew, all the actors, uh, <laughs> by the time this film was finished, because I knew what I wanted. I yeah. understand. And, yeah, I know, <laughs> I, and I, I, I know you do. No offense taken. <laughs> no, but uh, you, this. I knew I could do it. That's this the, is one of the nicest guys you will ever meet. If there were a room of 5,000 people, and he would be in, among the last five that you would think would be the guy who directed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> he, he is, I've known Toby since he made the film. Uh, He's one of the sweetest, nicest guys I've ever known. And so I often wonder where this stuff comes from. I mean, nobody ever said that about Hitler. They never said, you know, in spite of all the shit he did, he was a really nice guy. Or uh, what a great tap dancer he was, you know. You never hear that about guys who, you know, come up with stuff like that. And yet you, I, I wish you all got to know Toby personally. He's such a nice guy. So obviously you were inspired story-wise by Ed Gein and what he did. Any other movies that? Uh, oh, 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 you, you, that I saw that influenced me? Yeah, oh, or inspired you. Oh, oh, um, oh uh, Frankenheimer is uh, seconds. Uh-huh. Uh, awesome. And, and in fact, uh, that had the ironic humor, you know, when, when, when Will Gear sits on the on the bed of uh, of uh, Rock Hudson, and uh, kind of disappointed in him, you know, okay, kind of like he's being kicked off the football team, but when in fact they're sending him to the cadaver file, um, and uh, that you know that. That film became very important uh, for me. Uh, you ought to run that here sometime. Uh, yeah, it's in a family. That uh, is great. It is great. Seconds, directed by John Frankenheimer. And then, how did you? I let me share a story with you about how I direct, and the, even how I directed the actors in The Exorcist. I would always, before we, I would never really rehearse anything. I didn't, I believe that you lost it in rehearsal. But you just as a director had to be on the same page with the actor and understand what you were doing, what this thing is about, what your role in, in it is. And so we would talk a lot and I would find out things almost like a psychologist would find out things about the patient. And I would take these things and use them from time to time to provoke emotions. With Linda Blair, I learned that the saddest, worst day in her life was when her grandfather died. She was 12 when she made The Exorcist. And so I would sometimes directly and indirectly refer to her grandfather's death, or, or to other things that I learned about her and all the other actors 
to provoke the emotions that we wanted. Because, you know, an actor's sitting over here, and they're supposed to be looking over there at, let's say, the scariest thing in the world. But it isn't that. It's the crew. <laughs> you know, it's guys standing around, reading the newspaper, drinking coffee, sometimes talking. The fourth wall is not what the actor is reacting to. So as the director, I felt I had to produce the fourth wall in their imaginations. How did you work with the actors? I pitted them against one another. <laughs> I would not let them have dinner with Franklin. Uh, they shunned him. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I, you know, I, I would whisper lies into their ears. <laughs> And, and, um, and, and Leatherface was not allowed to come out of his trailer and makeup or, or anything. He was, he was like in jail. And, and, um, and um, he felt pretty, you know, I didn't want the other actors to see him until the moment I got my close up of the reaction, their reaction to him. And, um, and when the, the, the hammer hit comes, um, the, I had this, the, the, the real hammer that uh, then when I popped back, you know, I changed it to one that was more pliable, you know. Nice of you. Yeah, and, but it did knock, it did put a big welt on his head. It hit him right in the face. And, um, and, 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 uh, then I did a 27-hour shoot at the, the dinner table scene. What's a 27-hour shoot? It's 27 hours straight. And, and, and because, and because the, the guy was losing the, it, it was the last prosthetic appliances that I had. And then I had one, one actor, the Shakespearean actor, who was SAG, uh, that I'd worked a deal with um, uh, somehow, uh, Ron Bozeman. Who, who, who produced, produced Silence of the Lambs as well. He was, he was my UPM. And I don't know how he did it, but got, 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 got something out of SAG, but he had a cutoff date, and I, and I was losing him. And, uh, and so I had to just shoot until I, got in, until I got that scene. And, and in the meantime, I um, wanted uh, domestic animals uh, stuffed. And, um, and uh, Bob Burns, the art director, arranged to have some domestic animals brought out, but they weren't stuffed. It was a, a pickup, a, a, a dump truck full of animals from the, the pound on the bad day, you know, on their bad, their, God bless them. And, uh, and I mean, I, I truly mean that. And, and, and so uh, uh, Dottie Pearl, uh, my makeup artist was uh, uh, trying to shoot them full of formaldehyde, and she shot through one's leg and and, and shot herself with oh. formaldehyde. And she said, "This this isn't working." <laughs> and, and I said, "No." And I said, it's, uh, it, it, "It's so horrible. I mean, people will they can look at a dead body, but they can't look at a dead animal." Uh, without it turning, you know, without making it the wrong turn. And, and so they, um, I said, you know, please get rid of these. Uh, and um, so they took the dump truck about, uh, about 50 meters away from the house and dumped them out behind the, 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 uh, the house. And some idiot poured five gallons of gasoline on them. <laughs> And I'm talking about 1,500 pounds minimum, and and five gallons of gas, thinking, thinking that they would disappear, <laughs> you know. I mean, they'd seen that in a movie someplace, you know, when you pour the five gallons and light it, and they disappear. And and this this black oil smoke came up and would drift into the house. Well, all, the, the 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 props were real human bone and things like that. And they were still curing, too. And, and this, and this uh, ECO, the Sector Commercial, had uh, ASA rating of, I think, about 40. 
So the lights were just, I mean, so that shit started cooking. And, 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 and so I'd say cut and everyone would, anyway, they had to come out with Dramamine and the doc, a doctor did. And, and so it was just miserable as hell. Where, where was this house that you filmed? It, it, it was somewhere close to Round Rock, Texas. Which is near what it, that we would know. Um, n near, near Austin, mm -hmm. like 20 miles north of Austin. And it was an empty house? No, 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 it wasn't. No, this old hippie named Smokey <laughs> lived in the house. And we rented the house. I think the he's house. out there, but. I, he, he, <laughs> he could have been there. <laughs> and, and, um. <laughs> so you went to him. Yeah, to, to, to Smokey. To Smokey. And what'd you tell him? Uh, uh, f 50 bucks a week. To rent, rent did, he, did he care what you were going to shoot there? It, well, hell, it wasn't his house. He was just renting. And, and so. Uh, camping. Camping. Yeah. And so he moved in a little room that you never saw. You, you, you know, that you, you, you didn't have a sense of geography of where his. But who owned the house? Who no, knows? I have no idea. <laughs> but you know, later, there's a great feature, I know, on the Blu-ray, which is out there, the Blu-ray of this film. There's a great feature which shows that later on, that house became something of a, of a really decent restaurant, if it, you could. They, 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 they moved it to Taylor, Texas. That is, I, I'm not exactly sure where that is. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, hundred miles or more. And, and, and I've had people come to me with uh, uh, aquifer rock uh, foundation of the house that when they, they, they tore it up off the, its foundation um, to, to move it. Uh, and I had to, you know, ask me to sign rocks. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's hard to do. That's really hard to do. Yeah. And, and um, so, yeah, and, and, then, and then it became a restaurant. Uh, I, I, I rather wanted to, I thought at one time of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Hooper's Chainsaw Chili or something like that. <laughs> but, um, well, you can still do that. I can still do you know? that. You know? Yeah. It might work. Because this film's going to have a whole new life. Yeah. And uh, a part of that is happening right here tonight. Yeah. Um, what is it that scares you? Oh, you, you know, it, it, it's changed over, over um, you know, the length of time. I've uh, been afraid of almost everything. Um, but, but initially, it's all about uh, the monster is uh, the Grim Reaper, or, or death. Um, uh, th that, that's why I opened the, the film in the tone of that. Uh, graveyards scare the hell out of me. I, I mean, you know, neurotic-like scare the hell out of me. Um, uh, were you, were, did it help you to make this film? Did it remove any of the childhood fears that you took with you as you got older? N not, this, not this film. No, no, no. The childhood fear stayed a, a long time. When, when I was a little boy, really little boy, uh, I, I was ding dong in the hell out of my parents to take me to see a, a revival of Frankenstein was uh, show, uh, coming into the Paramount Theater in, in Austin on Congress Avenue. And, um, and um, it was a midnight showing, and it was, I don't know, this was sometime in the 40s or somewhere. Um, and, uh, and Frankenstein was going to be there in person. And, uh, you know, which would have meant a you know, rubber mask or whatever. And, and as it got closer and closer to it, but my grandmother told me tales, you, you, you can't kill him, you have to run him through a machine that crushes him or some, some kind of <laughs> shit like that. And, uh, and so, so I just knew he was going to get me. I mean, I, I knew it. That, you know, and then it was a packed house, and it was midnight, and, uh, and, I, and I flipped out. 
you know, I had, I had to leave. I, did, I, I didn't see Frankenstein until uh, uh, later, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I, if I, if I, I may have even uh, watched the, uh, uh, the Hammer, Curse of Frankenstein b before I, you know, I saw it, it's, it's, you know, it's a cool movie. I, I have no idea why I flipped out back then. <laughs> Uh, but it was the idea of it, the, the, uh, death personified, walking death. Uh, you think you could do a film like this again today? Do you still have that in you or that desire in you? You, 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 mean, you mean to make a scary film? Yeah. Yeah, yes, I, I, could, I could still do that. <laughs> I, I still have enough, uh, an, you know, enough fear to draw on. It would be, you know, it would be a different, well, I, I don't know, I mean, it, this film s seems as uh, politically correct for now as it did in, the, uh, in 1974. What do you mean politically correct? Well, it's well, the most politically incorrect film uh, I've ever well, seen. Well, okay, but, 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 but well, well, let me, let me, I, I, I won't pursue that, Bill. <laughs> no, oh, no. I don't give a damn. I mean, yeah. what's politically correct? But uh, here's, here's what's interesting. Harmony, I think, is what I'm talking about. Harmony? <laughs> the hell are you talking about? <laughs> but uh, here's what's interesting to me, and look around you. I mean, here is a, a full house audience. Forty years later, the film is not in IMAX, it's not in 3D, it doesn't have the CGI or award-winning cinematography. A lot of it is extraordinarily impressive, and yet it has this, whatever this hidden ingredient is, and I was thinking of, uh, about it earlier when you and I shared an umami burger. <laughs> There's something called umami in a hamburger. I don't know what the hell it is. Maybe you do. But this has umami. Right on, man. Right on. No 3D, no CGI. Welcome to this umami burger of a movie. It, if you haven't seen it, you will be unable to not give yourself to it. It is a very powerful experience. It transcends the genre. Anything you want to say before we tell them to yeah, roll well, like, well, well, Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. But it's about us. It's about our, 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 our past. Sure. You, you, just before you got in touch with me, I, I uh, stopped at a 7-Eleven store and, uh, uh, to get a Dr. Pepper. And, uh, and, and so I was paying for the Dr. Pepper and then uh, People Magazine uh, was in front of me. And there was a picture of you and Dino De Laurentiis uh, coming out from some doors into like a, out of a small theater or screening room. And, and, and so I, moved in on the, uh, uh, the caption beneath the picture. And it said that, uh, it said that it, it, was, it was William Friedkin showing uh, Dino De Laurentiis' uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, and, and then I heard from you and I, it blew my mind. I remember I called you right after I saw the film and I ran the film for everyone I could in 74. I ran it for producers, for studio heads. I think you hooked up with Universal. I, I did, yes. Right Great. after that. And made a, a bunch of other really wonderful films. But I remember there was something magnetic that drew me to this film, the artistry with which it was made, the skill and the power that the, the film had. And I pretty much saw it as my 
role to be the town crier about it. That is true. Yeah, thank you, man. No, no, you, you know, but I love this. I still love it. I'm going to watch it again. Um, I, I just thought it was great and uh, never lose an opportunity to keep talking about it. We've remained friends, so we haven't seen a lot of each other because we live in different places. But we've remained friends, almost like brothers, I would say. I would say. And uh, would you believe it? He's actually younger than me. <laughs> you guys believe that? Uh, Am I? I think so. <laughs> so just before we go, I just want to remind Chris in the booth up there, we got to take the lights down on these pharaohs. Don't forget that. <laughs> We got to get these guys down. We got to get this room really dark. Yeah. Everybody, everybody's got to get out of the way and don't hurt yourself while you're getting yourself out of the way because in a couple of minutes, as soon as we hobble off this stage, <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is coming at you. It is coming at you. And now, let's hear Thank it you. for Toby Hooper, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.